Hey, this is Joe Gilder from HomestudioCorner.com. I've been running Home Studio Corner since 2009, posting videos to YouTube, doing podcasts, courses, all that stuff. And one thing I've realized lately is I want to get back to covering some of the basics, not exclusively, but to have a, a series of videos, maybe once a week, where I'm covering some of the basic elements of recording and music that a lot of people, a lot of new subscribers may not be aware of, and maybe they haven't seen some of the older videos back in the archives. And I realize I'm making a lot of assumptions about what you understand or what you have experience with or uh, what you know. And as anyone who's been in audio or music for any length of time, whether this is your first day or your 10th decade, okay, that's weird, <laughs> whether it's your first day or your millionth day, um, there is a lot to know and a lot to learn. And I, you know, years later, I'm still learning. And I realized that everyone who watches this channel is going to be on a little bit different place on the journey. I want to make sure that I'm being helpful to everyone, right? Um, so there will be, I'll still do a lot of the same stuff I've been doing. Uh, lots of stuff showing the music that I'm making right now. A lot of behind the scenes stuff. A lot about mixing and recording and all those things. Absolutely, that's not going to change. But in addition to that, I want to cover some of the more basic stuff that it's easy to overlook or it's easy to assume that everybody's got that foundational stuff down pat, but maybe you don't. Maybe you need some refreshers. So that's what this series of videos is going to be. Okay, so today I thought to kick off all of these videos, all of this, all this idea, this whole series, I want to talk about and explain the recording process, right? Because we, we know that it involves... There's obviously there has to be a song and it involves recording and there's mixing and then something called editing and there's mastering and um, then there's all the stuff in between. And, and it may be a little bit overwhelming to think of a project from start to finish of, of knowing really with confidence what has to happen between, OK, I've got nothing and fast forward a few months and I've got a finished album. OK, so I want to talk through that in kind of bigger picture terminology, right? I'm not going to teach you how to mix a song in this video. That's what eight years of content on Home Studio Corner will do. Uh, but I am going to teach you the overall process. Now, am I saying this is the guaranteed best way to record and produce music? No, but this is the way that I do it. It's my process, and it has become a process over the years. Having done this so many times, I find myself doing the same types of things over and over and over again. Now, does that mean that everything I release sounds the same? No, not at all. What's cool about this is I have a process that stays roughly the same, but the content of the process changes dramatically. So one part of the process, as you can imagine, is, well, for most projects, record vocals. Well, within, that, within those two words, there's a whole host of options. Um, what microphone you're going to use, what preamp you're going to use, what the vocal performance is going to be. Will you double the vocal or not? I mean, there's all those decisions to be made. So while, yes, we're going to record vocal, there's lots of things to do and decisions to make around that, okay? So by having maybe a general process, and your process may be different from mine, but having a process is helpful because it kind of helps you know what the next step is. Otherwise, it just looks like one big mess of things to do. If you've ever done this, you've got so much to do, you write it all down on a list, and then you look at the list, and you don't really feel any better because now you just have this massive list that you probably feel even more overwhelmed by now that you got it out of your head. It's only when you put that list into some sort of a organized format that it begins to feel a little less overwhelming, right? If you look at it and say, well, I can't do that until I do this, so let me not worry about this, and what's the very next thing I need to do on this project? Oh, it's just this. Now that's all I have to think about. I don't have to think about the rest until this one piece of the puzzle is done. That's how I want you, and I encourage you to think about the recording process. Um, if, you're, if you're a nerd like me, you've probably read books like Getting Things Done by David Allen. Um, I don't adhere to much of the process that he recommends in that book. I've tried it, it just didn't work for me. But one thing that I do think is really powerful is this idea of what's the next action. So if you're thinking of a big, huge project like releasing an album, that's a big, huge project. It may seem overwhelming, but there really will literally be only one next action that you need to do to move that project forward. And it may simply be schedule session, right? Get find a time on the calendar to do this work. It may be email drummer. 
It may be, and usually it's going to be something fairly simple. And once you do that, there's a next step. Now, do I think you need to get out your yellow pad and write down all these steps and have check marks by each one and go through it? No, I think that might be a waste of time and that actually might be overwhelming as well. All you have to come up with is what's the next thing I need to do. And once you know that, either do it or figure out when you're going to do it and you're off to the races. So let's talk about the recording process, okay? Um, as much as I'd love to do this as a cute video where it's like, the seven-step recording sequence, it's just not, it's not that sexy, right? It's just a normal process for me, and it really just boils down to you've got prep work, you've got recording work, you've got mixing work, you've got mastering work. Mixing and mastering kind of mush together, so... We'll just say there's really just kind of three basic arenas. Getting ready, pre-production, prep work, actually making the music, which is recording, uh, programming, um, and I would include any kind of editing, any kind of work that needs to be done before it's time to mix it, and then mixing and mastering go together. So the biggest piece of that bubble, obviously, or for the most part, I would think, is the middle one, right? Where you're doing all the recording, you're making, you're creating the music, right? It is coming from out of nothing. You know, it's a very godlike thing to create music. You're creating something from nothing. It's a very creative thing, right? Um, that That's going to take up the bulk of the time, I find, usually, um, between coming up with what to record and doing all the editing that maybe needs to happen, tuning, pocketing, all that stuff happens in that kind of bubble before it moves on to mixing. So let's talk about if those th are the three kind of pillars of the process, the three phases you got to go through, then let's talk about each of those, okay? So the first one, uh, I like to call it pre-production. It's the idea of before I sit down and whether I'm just recording an, an acoustic album of just me and my guitar and a voice or whether I'm getting a full band in here and we're going to track everything at once or maybe I'm going to just record drums first and then bass and then electric and then acoustic and then trumpet. Whatever the process is, there has to be some planning beforehand. And for me, what that looks like for me, I do a lot of kind of... Um, some acoustic stuff and then a fair amount of full band stuff that typically starts off the big initial day of kind of what I would call the recording phase is a tracking day where you've got a drummer there and a bass player and then maybe a guitar player too and they're all recording something. But before that day comes, obviously some things need to happen. So let's talk about what, what kind of goes under that umbrella of pre-production. For me, there's a couple things there. One would be obviously the song right? There, need, there needs to be a song in existence before any of this can happen, and the song needs to be finished, and it needs to be good. Now, I could sit here and talk about that for the next hour, right? How important that part of the process is. If you've got a crap song that you're embarrassed about, and you just want to dive in and record it, I think your, a better use of your time would be to hold off on everything and write until you have a song that you're proud of. It doesn't have to be the best song in the history of the world, but if it's something you're embarrassed about from the get-go, you're not going to have the energy or the motivation to plug through the, the more arduous parts of the process, that middle section where it just feels like you're spending so much time and there's so many things that still left undone before you even get to the fun mixing part and the master. If you don't love the song now, you're definitely not going to love the song six weeks from now when you've got a bunch of stuff recorded, but you've still got to record a bunch of more stuff. So please please record good music, okay? I know that's that's saying a lot and it's out of your control if it's not your music and it's someone else, but you have control over who you record and it's not completely unheard of to say, hey, I think you've got a better song in you. Let's hold off. Why don't you go write some more songs? I've told this story before several years ago when I was getting ready to release a full-length album or I wanted to start recording a full-length album. I knew I wanted it to be all original music. So I decided instead of just writing 10 songs and putting them on an album, I was going to write 50 songs and then narrow it down to the best 10 and then put those on the album. And I did. Over a 12-week period, which would seem like a waste of time, I wrote on average one song per weekday. It ended up being actually like 26 or 7 songs in the last two weeks of the period because I'm a procrastinator. But anyway, I ended up writing the 50 songs. And of those 50, I chose 13, and those went on the album. It's called Better This Way. And it's something I'm really proud of, and those songs, I think, are great. And I'm really proud that I 
wrote lots of songs and many of them garbage so that I could get to those few pearls that were worth it. And that entire process was completely worth it for me. If it honed my writing skills for one thing, so I'm more able to write decent songs more quickly, um, but it also just, it, it allowed me to be choosy. So if you come into the studio and you've only ever written one song and it's not a very good one, you're shooting yourself in the foot. The other option is write 10 songs and then maybe one of them will be really good or two of them. And then maybe that's how you start. You start small with just one or two good songs versus recording 10 mediocre songs, okay? So this is even before, it's really even before pre-production, there need to be good songs in existence, okay? Now, for some people, they, they do their writing as they record. So if you're an electronic musician or you do a lot of pop music or you do a lot of writing inside your, your DAW, inside your software, it's, it's a different workflow, right? I tend to do kind of rock, folk music, that's kind of where I tend to live. So a lot of that is a song that I could go play at a writer's night and then I come into the studio to record it. Those are the kind of clients I work with. That's the kind of music I make. I don't write in, I don't like write with loops and things like that. I'm not against it. I probably should and I probably will one day. But for me, writing a song means sitting down with a guitar or a piano and a piece of paper and like writing, okay? And then that, so that, to me, that's a whole whole piece of the puzzle that is kind of sacred to me. I want to, I really try to keep writing as its own thing. I want to write and just enjoy the writing process and create good music, obviously thinking about how it's going to be recorded, but mostly focusing on a song that can stand by itself if it's just me and a guitar. If it's just me and a guitar and I have to explain, well, you know, you should, in in the recording, you'll hear a piano over here and then there's another guitar doing this thing and there'll be a background vocal doing this other thing and there's this cool loop happening that's going to make it sound really cool. Just imagine all that happening while I play this song for you. If, If you need all that to make it a good song, I would argue it's not a good song. A good song for me, and you don't have to follow my definition, but my definition of a good song is a song that can stand by itself with just a performer and an instrument. If it does, then... You can only imagine how it can be even better by adding a bunch of production on top of it, by recording a full band, by producing a bunch of beats and loops behind it. All that stuff is great, but you have to start with a good song, okay? So let's say, let's assume you've got a collection of good songs, songs that you deem good. What's the next step? Well, unless you are going to do everything yourself, or even if you are going to do everything yourself, you need some sort of a roadmap for these songs. For me, a roadmap to songs looks like writing out charts. Like literally writing, hang on, let me get one for you. I'll show you what it looks like. So here are some charts from my latest EP, okay? They look like this, okay? They're handwritten, and essentially any musician kind of in the Nashville world can come sit down, listen to the song once, and then look at this chart, and they will play through the song because the chart tells them everything they need to know. It tells them what chords to play. Okay, that's kind of a given. It also tells them how long to play them. So, for example, I don't know how well you can see this, but for the intro to this song, Someone to Blame, the chords are B minor, D, A, E, and then it repeats B minor, D, A, E. Um, And each of those is one bar, okay? One measure, one measure of B minor, one measure of D, and so on and so forth. So by someone looking at this, they can sit down, and if they're a good musician, they know exactly how the song's going to be. They literally may not even need to listen to the entire song. If the chart's well-written, that that can be both a good and a bad thing, but they can play through it. And that's exactly what I did for this EP, and that's exactly how I approach all my projects. I sit down with a guitar, and I either I'm the musician and I play it and write the chart as I'm playing it, or I have someone play it and I chart it out. The other part of the pre-production process, this is huge. Writing charts is huge. The other part of the pre-production process is recording some sort of demo version of the song. There are two kind of ways I like to approach this. One could be to just have them sit in front of a microphone and play. Perform the song as if, like we mentioned before, you're performing it just with your voice and an instrument and you're, you know, performing for a small group of people. What does it sound like? Okay. Capture that and then you can write your charts and you can kind of work from there. The other way, I've done that before. To me, that feels like a little bit of a waste of time. Unless you're pressed for time and the the artist is in town and can record these and then is leaving or can't be at your studio very much and you've got to do a lot of the work by yourself, that's great. Otherwise, what I like to do is have them record the songs to a click track 
which which when you hear the word click track, it just means you open up your DAW, you set the tempo, you hit record, and there's a a metronome ticking in their ears and their headphones while they're recording. So they're recording to a tempo. You don't have to do that, but for me, that is hugely helpful because now it's it's recorded to a a set tempo that I can then, if you know, later on, if someone records, you know, uh, a really cool background vocal track on the first chorus, I can take that, copy it, and paste it to the third and fourth choruses because they're all at the exact same tempo. If you record without a click track, then you can't do a lot of that flying stuff around stuff that'll come later. We'll talk about that in another another day. But recording a, what I call scratch tracks to a tempo, to a click track, to a metronome, is really the first time that I hit the record button, okay? And it's a vital part of the pre-production process. So the way that works for me, actually, as far as like what comes first, I schedule a session, I get the artist here. I schedule usually at least a half-day session to have them come and play and sing their songs. And if they know the songs well and they're okay with playing to a click track, I'll send them in the other room, We'll, just, we'll determine the tempo. We'll spend a lot of time making sure the tempo is right. That's hugely important. Listen, play the song, play a chorus of the song to a tempo and make sure that feels right. Because you, It's hard to go back and change that after the fact. But once we've narrowed down a tempo, they'll put on headphones, they'll record the guitar or the piano full, through the entire song. And then I'll set up a mic and have them sing over that, okay? Now we've got a vocal and a guitar for the song. While they're singing, they'll notice if they played something wrong and we'll decide, okay, you know what, that we shouldn't play that turnaround twice after the first chorus, it seems too long, let's cut that. Well, guess what? Because you recorded to a grid, to a metronome, you can go take four of those measures, delete them, slide everything over, and keep going. These tracks aren't meant to be final recordings. They can be, and sometimes they are, but usually they're just meant to be a guide that you can then manipulate and, and kind of work the arrangement out on the screen and get it how you want it. Now, a lot of times it's exactly how it needs to be in the first pass of recording and you don't have to do those changes, but you can if you record to a click track. From there, once these are recorded, so that's really the first step. Once once songs have been chosen and they've hired me to do the project, they come in, they record the guitar, they record the vocal, now we're going somewhere. The next step for me is to pull out a piece of paper and I listen. Sometimes I do this while they're recording the vocal and I will write out the chart. I'll chart the song and make it look like this by the end. From there, we're done, okay? That, that to me, pre-production is almost done. From there, I'll listen to the songs. I'll usually make copies, put them on my phone, listen to them over the next few days, and kind of dream with just a guitar and a vocal of what I think the song should be. And once I've come up with uh, at least a basic vision of, okay, I hear, obviously, I, I definitely hear drums and bass and guitars, um, here's kind of the rough idea of what I hear. I don't usually hear everything in my head up front. I hear a general vague direction and then we go in that direction. So from there, once pre-production is done, once I've, we've decided on arrangement, we've recorded it, we've written the chart, now is the time where the real recording happens. Now I'm scheduling a session to have a drummer come in, maybe even a bass player and a guitar player, and we're gonna Actually, they're going to listen to the scratch tracks that we recorded. They're going to hear the click track in their ears and they're going to play along to it and we're off to the races, right? This is the fun part. But all of that can't happen until all this pre-production has happened first. So if you are the kind to just have the band come over and say, hey, what do you guys got? Um, record. Let's see. Go play. It's not going to go nearly as well as if you have some some things mapped out. You can leave room. Like I'll have sessions where... Once everyone's in the room, we say, hey guys, you know what? It would be great to repeat the, the last line of the chorus at the end. And I can quickly go in to my system, just cut that section, move it over, duplicate it, and then everybody plays along to that. That's easy to do. Those kind of changes, you always want to be flexible and leave yourself open for when creative moments happen in the room. But if you start off with no plan and you're recording without a click and there aren't really any charts, suddenly it's starting to feel very chaotic you'll feel stressful, the project may still go wonderfully, but it also may get kind of derailed, and you'll wish that you had spent more time doing the pre-production stuff, okay? So I've already gone, I talked way longer about pre-production than I expected to, so we're gonna cut this up into a series of videos we'll talk about, and the next one we'll talk about the recording process, which is 
so fun. And some of the things that I like to do in that, in that process to make my life easier and to get good results. And then we'll move on to the mixing and mastering process too and talk about a few things to keep in mind about that. If this video is helpful for you and you want more like this that talk about some of the basics of recording, uh, basics of this whole production thing, leave a comment below and let me know. I love to hear from you. And uh, most people watch these things and they move on and move away and they don't leave a comment. But I really would love to hear from you and hear your thoughts and uh, hear your feedback, whether it's good or bad. Uh, it's all good for me um, and it helps me to help you better. So thanks for watching. Again, I'm Joe from homestudiocorner.com. I'll see you around.